And this tutorial will create a new project, we'll generate a solution for the project, a Visual Studio solution, and we will build the Visual Studio solution. So first you want to open your launcher, create a project. You can choose any of the templates that are available. We're going to use the C++ blank template. Name it whatever you would like. Create the project. This assumes obviously you've already downloaded the engine from initializing a project. Once the project is created, we will reveal the project in Explorer, which will open Windows Explorer for us. On the Cry project, we have several context options by right clicking. For now, we're going to go into the Generate Solution. You get a pop up. Here is where you get to choose which version of Visual Studio you would like to use, seeing as we're using 2017 64 bit. I'm going to choose this one, generate the solution. So once you've generated the solution, you'll find a new folder here, Solutions. In here, you'll find all the different projects for Visual Studio and the encompassing solution file. This file is the solution file that holds all the projects and all the settings for different projects. This is the one that you want to open in Visual Studio. You can either choose the selector or the actual Visual Studio, it doesn't matter that much. Once you've opened Visual Studio, this is something you'll see when you first launch Visual Studio. The general settings is the default workspace view. There's no need to change this if you're not familiar with it. It's probably better to get used to this. And the color scheme is whichever you prefer. So we're going to use the dark theme, which is quite popular. Start Visual Studio. And here we go. Here's the Visual Studio interface. So the important things here are on the side here, you have the Solution Explorer. You also have your project with the source files. You may notice uh, in the top left area of the workspace, we have this drop down here, which is the solution configurations drop down selection menu. This holds the three configuration types we use. These determine the amount of profiling, debugging options we have, and the performance. It also defines, say, for example, you choose release, there will be certain parts of the code that are not included in the release version. Some CVARs, for example, might be locked to specific values. It also might not load assets that are not in .pak files. These are packaged assets. So these kind of things are optimizations for a release build, for a end user package. Debug is different in the way that you have more debugging control. Certain optimizations during compilation are turned off. So this can slow the performance of the code, but it also gives you more control over debugging and giving you the, the data and the function calls that are actually being called and not optimized away, making it difficult to track what's going on. But usually we personally use profile. Profile is an optimized debugging environment. It gives you debugging options without so much of the performance penalties. It does this by turning on very specific optimization flags in the compiler. So we have enough to work with to get a good overview of being able to debug certain things, but it's not quite as slow as debug. So we prefer to use profile as it doesn't slow us down as much and gives us the benefit of debugging the project. Another note is we also ship the launcher engine in profile. We do provide release binaries, but the engine itself, if you were to create a new project and launch the project, these all use the profile binaries. For debug and profile also, these are usually compatible. So you, with the profile engine that we ship through the launcher, you can build your project in debug and this will work with the launcher engine. What isn't possible is to mix debug in release or profile in release. So release is a separate incompatible version between debug and profile. So never mix release with debug and profile. I would recommend sticking with profile for now as that gives you the best option of both worlds.
As you can see, uh, we have six projects succeeded. These are all these projects listed on the right here. Most of these are just part of the build system. All build, install, zero check. Uh, the game is the actual game project itself. You have three extra projects here that are simply used to allow you to easily choose how you want to start your project. So if you want to start your project in Sandbox, you'll want to right click on the editor project and set as the startup project. Then you can simply launch the debugger. So you can debug uh, from here, F5, or you can simply click the local Windows debugger button. This will then start the sandbox editor, which will automatically load the project that you've just built. So now that we're in the editor, you can see uh, we've launched our blank project. You can see in the title bar up top, and you can now go ahead and open your level. You can see it's running fine. We can move around, there's no issues. So now we have the CryEngine project open, we can see the Visual Studio project uh, themselves. You can ignore the CMake predefined targets. This is used by the build system. This is handled automatically for us. The projects that you want to take note of is the game project. This is where the source code for your CryEngine project resides. You have three helper projects down here that determine which part of CryEngine you would like to start. So if you want to start your project in the sandbox editor, you can select the editor and set a startup project. If you would like to start uh, your project in the game launcher, which is what, say, an end user would see, then you can select this as a startup project. What this allows you to do is to choose how your debugger is attached so when you were to start debugging it will automatically start either the game launcher or the sandbox editor or the game server instance and so for now we're going to stick with the editor uh, startup project so i'll explain slightly the structure of this blank template you'll notice we do have um, some player cpp and .h files uh, under the components folder so even in the blank template, we have the ability to move around and look around in the map. And this is handled in this player component. You'll probably immediately see we define the keyboard inputs where we define the, the group, the name of the uh, action, and we actually define the buttons that invoke this action. So I won't go into the implementation of this, just know that this file handles the player component itself such as movement and looking around the speed you look around the speed you move around and uh, yeah the spawning as well so when you actually go into the game you also note that the game plugin is here as well this is the entry for every single plugin so this defines a unique ID, for example. This is handy if you want to access this plugin from another plugin. So the way CryEngine handles the different plugin types is using a type reflection or type management. You define a unique ID. This is unique for every single plugin. And we call these types in C++. So you can easily reference other plugins using this unique ID or the type, which is automatically assigned to this unique ID. So this is why we need unique IDs for every single plugin. Aside from this, you'll be able to see how the plugin actually starts, setting up of the, the player, getting ready to spawn the player, and the registration of schematic components, which the player component actually is a entity component, which is registered via this schematic call. And you can see here in game mode, which is not the editor mode, when it's in game mode, it will automatically load the map example. So that's a brief overview of the structure. What we can do is make a slight modification to the player CPP file to show you how easy it is and how quick the project builds and how fast you can see it in the engine. So what we're going to do is take the update event 
from the process events. This is a function that every entity component has that you can register to take the update events. You have to tell the entity system that you want this update. So we're saying here that we want the start game update and the event update calls. So we're going to add to the end of this a call to draw a text table to the screen. So we can easily use the global environment variable, get the renderer interface, the aux renderer, which is an auxiliary renderer. But it allows us to add certain things to the screen for debug purposes or other purposes that we might want to see what's going on. Um, with this, you can use the draw 2D label function, give it a offset on the screen, 50 across, 50 down. Size, just going to put 5. We want a color, I'm just going to put white for now. And we don't want the position centered. And oh, we'll do some text here. Um, test. So now that we have our new addition to the project, we can build this project. Once the project has compiled, you should see uh, succeeded here in the output. You can now make sure that the editor is set as the startup project and launch the debugger using this local Windows debugger button. Now you see the sandbox start, we want to open up our level and hopefully we see in the top left corner some test label. So that's how easy it is to compile, uh, change, build and test changes to your project. This concludes the generation and building of the Visual Studio solution for a project.